Okay, so I am Brian Cardell. Uh, this is part three of a series that we've been recording with different guests talking about web ecosystem health. Effectively, this is just like a place for us to come and have sort of long form conversations on topics that we sort of historically don't talk about for some reason. Uh, we talk a lot about how many rendering engines we have and a lot of concern around that, but we don't talk about how we got those rendering engines or like, are they healthy? Are we going to be able to keep them? Why does it look that way? What can we do to make it better? Uh, is it more or less healthy than it was in the past? Like, are we going in a good direction or are things getting worse? To carry on this conversation today, uh, I have three ex-Opera fellows here. One of them also is involved with another rendering engine, Prince XML. Uh, we'll talk about that too. So if you could just introduce yourselves briefly. So my name is Håkon Vjumli, and uh, I have been on the web for a very long time. I proposed CSS in 1994. I joined Opera Software in 1999, and I became the chairman of Prince, which you mentioned briefly, uh, in the 2000s. So the the web rendering engines and standards and such uh, have been very near and dear to me. I, I'm doing many other things too uh, these days, uh, but I still have you know uh, a passionate belief in the web that we need to 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 take care of it and and uh, hold it to high standards all right uh, i'm vadim uh, makiev uh, i'm from st petersburg russia i used to work uh, at opera uh, in uh, opera devrel team uh, together with bruce and uh, basically promoting or representing opera browser in uh, russia and russian speaking countries uh, I'm, I'm not a browser engine developer i'm just a front-end developer but that's that's the reason why all web standards and the health of our industry or the diversity of web engines is uh, very important to me. So um, that's that's why I'm good friend of web standards, and um, I'm yeah I'm here to discuss what, what's what's going to happen next with the browser engines and such. So hi, I'm Bruce Lawson. I uh, used to work with Vadim in Opera Software in developer relations, and for the last eighteen months of Opera as we knew it, I was deputy CTO. So I was the Robin to Hawkins Batman. Um, I've long been interested in the web since I first discovered it in 99 when I was living in Thailand and it uh, changed my life. And I got into it and published the first book on web accessibility. So like Vadim, I'm not a browser engine developer. I'm not going to say I'm just a front-end developer because front-end developers are not a a secondary occupation, but I do some front-end development, mostly on accessibility and web standards, but like Vadim, keep a, a close eye on what's going on because I believe that the more diversity we have, the healthier the ecosystem is, and I want the web to win. Uh, so since neither of you mentioned it, I will mention that uh, Vadim and Bruce have started a new podcast of their own called the F Word Podcast. Uh, it's been very good and interesting for me to listen to. So you should check that out. I was recently a guest on there. I think I was their first guest, actually. Oh, yeah. First and only. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess let's talk about what everybody agrees to about rendering engines is that like having more than one seems like a good idea. <laughs> and uh, that having more than one means that we have some degree of inefficiency. I posit that standards always also require some competition and some failure. I feel like we've made some mistakes in the past trying to skip that step. But um, I don't know. What, what do you think? I, I think... How do we get the engines that we have today? You can track really two main. There's the Gecko servo engine and the WebKit oriented lineage. There used to be another one that was Opera's Presto, right? There's an interesting story. <laughs> Who wants to tell it? Uh, well, I can tell it. Presto was uh, Opera's rendering engine indeed. It was our pro proprietary code uh, that we we rewrote and, and launched in uh, 2003, I believe. And um, the roots of that engine, of course, came from our headquarters in Oslo, which was in Valdemar Tranesgata. And, and in that very same building was also Trolltech. It was kind of a, a hub for internet startups uh, at the time. And one of the employees of, of Trolltech was Lars Knoll, who uh, was, if not the person, at least one of the very key persons in 
taking khtml uh, and building it out as a as as a code base that uh, apple and google and microsoft even you know now build their browsers on and even opera so um, although Lars, uh, there's some discussion, you know, how much work did Lars do on, on KHTML in that very building? But I, I, th I think we can say it's kind of a cradle, cradle of two uh, web rendering engines in, in, in one place. And we've actually, last year, uh, we were very happy when the Historical Society of Oslo agreed to put on a on a plaque, one of these historical plaques that you find uh, that often, you know, they go back to the 16th century telling us what happened then. Uh, this plaque that we put up on this building, you know, tells the story of two rendering engines and how those two engines really changed uh, the world in the sense that they allowed us to to surf the web on mobile phones it's amazing it's amazing i, I can read the plaque it's, it's very short in this building the opera web browser and the qt toolkit was developed 1998 till 2012 the rendering engines presto and webkit made internet on mobile phones possible what i like about uh, this story is that um, usually these historical plaques or certainly in the uk are put on sort of uh, beautiful old buildings um, the first half of my career at Opera was spent in 98, uh, Voldemar Thrana's Garter. And I believe I'm not doing it too much of a disservice, Halcombe, by saying that it was many things, but that building is not noted for its beauty. Yeah, that, that's indeed correct. That's not why we love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was not only ugly from outside, I would say, but it was uh, really hard to navigate from inside. It was also great because all the programmers and others who have worked on these rendering engines came together and, and, and we had a kind of a, a rendering uh, rendering engine, you know, meetup, uh, a giant one. And, you know, this is, I think, maybe the first and probably the only time the word rendering engine uh, will end up on a historical plaque. <laughs> I, sus I suspect you're right, but it's interesting because uh, I, I, not reading Norwegian, Alkoma, I hadn't re really understood what the plaque said, but it's interesting it says made the web possible on mobile phones because one of the great things about Presto from, I mean, I wasn't there when it was developed uh, initially, but one of the great things about it is because it was designed to go on underpowered devices and mobile phones, it, from its very inception, it was incredibly lightweight. I recall that when we experimented putting Blink on the Opera mini servers, which are proxy servers for underpowered browsers in, you know, India, Bangladesh, etc., we needed something like eight times the number of servers to run Blink for the same number of users as we did Presto. Yeah, no, that's true. Presto was indeed very, very um, uh, resource uh, effective. And th there were several reasons for that. First, we didn't have all the programmers at Opera. We didn't have access to all the funding that Netscape, for example, had in, in, in Silicon Valley. We couldn't hire all those programmers. We had to rely on only a few and they couldn't write that much code. So it, it tended to be very, very compact. And also we were very conscious that we wanted Opera to run on first low-end PCs. Uh, PCs, for example, a 386 that your uncle had and you wanted to, to put him on the web. He had maybe a modem in 1999. And uh, in order to run on that computer, you, you, had, to, you had to be very small. Uh, so for a long time, Opera's code fit on a floppy. This was up until we, we added, added CSS. Then we got past that 1.44 megabyte mark. So we couldn't use the term, the, the slogan fits on a floppy any longer. We had to change it to almost fits on a floppy, which doesn't quite have the same ring to it. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask my my article that sort of launched this conversation a little bit. Um, I talk about the fact that 
you can divide the web up into like a few different eras and, and say these sort of broad statements about it. And one thing that you can notice today is that all of the engines that we have are open source for browser, like the, the three browser rendering engines that remain are open source. And we used to have more, but the more were proprietary. Like that's interesting because it, like opens up a lot of interesting discussions. Like in in some ways, I posit that the open source nature of like KHTML and WebKit and Gecko as well, like have been a boon because should a company ever, as they tend to do, as we know, change or disappear, we don't just lose that investment. So I think that part of it is actually really healthy. But there's another part of this, which is like who funds the development of these. And that like has changed because the proprietary ones maybe had some business models behind them in some cases. And I think Opera, that might be the case. So can, like, can you talk about any of that? Certainly, Opera was founded as a commercial company. Uh, there was a market for, for better browsers. Uh, people actually bought browsers. They bought licenses of, of Opera in enough numbers that it uh, helped pay for the programmers. This was before search engine, so th th there wasn't an option of getting a cut from uh, from search engines. We had to actually Opera had to sell licenses in order to survive. Now, you know, a lot of Americans paid for that uh, license. Not so many Russians did so, but we became very popular in in Russia still because they didn't. Oh, yeah, I, I can confirm. Uh, I I bought my license. You paid for it. You were the one before. Yeah, the one and only. Yeah, before joining Opera. Uh, but uh, because uh, it was a gesture of appreciation rather than uh, need, because uh, the, the the first result you would see in Yandex by Google, by uh, searching for uh, Opera serial would be a serial number, and Opera w wouldn't even um, check if it's unique. Uh, if it's if it's unique or if it's used before, it was rather it wasn't it wasn't like like uh, licensing Microsoft Word or something. No, it was just a serial number, and op I guess Opera trusted and all and never tried to to prosecute this illegal usage of serial numbers. I guess. Yeah, we, we we never we never went after anyone for for doing that, and then then Opera went into a model where we. You know, had advertisements in a little window, a banner area in, in the right-hand corner. That didn't work so so well either. We had some income, but it was mostly to force people to buy a license. I think if we made if if there's one key mistake we did at Opera, it was to not open source the code. Firefox, on the other hand, they started out being an open source browser. And they got a lot of attention from American journalists because they were uh, seen as kind of the new thing. Open source was very politically correct. And the fact that they didn't have ads was also good. Uh, journalists were hesitant to recommend Opera to their readers because you would get ads as a result of that. So from that, so from that perspective, uh, Firefox was more compelling. And for a while, even though I think Opera was a better and faster browser, Firefox got much higher growth rates than, than, than Opera. I think we could have changed that if we had been open source at the time, we would have taken more of that growth to Opera and, and the world would have been different. After, after Opera Mini became a thing, became quite popular in the world, I think it was too late to open source because it was a pretty unique product, it was the, uh, one of the biggest um, uh, streams of income. Although I do think that we could have open sourced it and continued with um, making money from Opera Mini because open sourcing the code is one thing, but having massive glacier cool server farms is what actually drove Opera Mini, and that takes an investment. Whether or not we should have open sourced Presto, I, I don't know. And the thing is, once we had retired Presto from the main mobile browser and the desktop browser and adopted Blink, Presto was still running. Uh, Opera Mini and still is in Opera Mini Extreme mode. And people used to ask me all the time, you know, why don't you open source it? And the answer was basically for expedience. You, you don't want to open source a product just by stuffing it all on the internet with an Apache license. 
you need, you know, if you're open sourcing a project, you need to curate that to document it and to, you know, have somebody taking, um, you know, taking pull requests, etc. And I just don't think there was the appetite in the company to spend lots of time and energy curating something which we had made a business decision to move away from. You know, Presto remained pretty static after we went to Blink. Well, I'd like to pick up on something you said there, Bruce. You called it a business decision to move to Blink. That's is true. This is true. Yeah, and it's it's more complex than that. I, from my perspective, at least, I think the decision was not made by the accountants at Opera. Mm-hmm. Uh, the decision was actually made by the programmers. They saw that they were spending a lot of time uh, keeping up with the bugs of other browsers. They were always a little bit behind. And if they could instead join forces with those other browsers in the in an open source project, their, their code would, uh, first it would reach more users, which is always a good feeling for a programmer. And you would also feel part of a community, something that was moving forward. You would look, look to the future rather than look back. So, so um, I remember it, this is, 2013, right? So it's a long time ago, but still, I remember it as being the a technical decision that was made. And the accountants were probably happy that they didn't have to employ those hundred people playing catch up. We could we could we could use those people for other things or or for contributing to to an open source project, which felt good. I I think that not a lot of people have a good grasp on like what it takes to make and maintain a browser. There was a long history early on of browsers being interoperable enough to get something done, but very, very painful. And the interoperability bar on the web just keeps going up and we keep getting more features. So it keeps growing. And I think this actually interplays with market share. At some point, it appears to hit somewhat of a tipping point where enough of your users use that, that people begin only testing on that. Some fraction of properties begin suggesting that you should just get that browser. There, You wind up with lots of bugs because somebody has to implement first and the one that has the largest market share also winds up having the largest budget. So it, it, like it winds up being something of a feedback loop. There are still, even to this day, lots of things that we discover, uh, oh, that is not actually written down anymore. Yeah, that, yeah, that was a, a, a long and tedious battle for Opera to, to, to make sure that all the you know, banks in America worked in the Opera browser. And we couldn't really open bank accounts all over. You know, it's hard to test. It's hard to verify. Uh, it's, 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 it's something we put a lot of resources into, but it was never very fancy or entertaining work. So I used to work with uh, big Russian companies and small ones as well uh, to to make sure that uh, the code they ship is compatible with Opera and also uh, Opera engineers know what their needs are. Uh, I mean, developers' needs. And, and the same was uh, the case for Latin America, US, um, China, India, and some many other com- uh, countries in the world. And uh, that was our attempt rather to keep up with with uh, this thing but uh, you know i remember the, this this line this graph at our uh, jira uh incoming box like the red line it was always going up uh, incoming inco- incoming uh compatibility box and there was a line a uh, green line uh, of a number of bugs that we we fixed and it they were they would never meet even with a hundred people working on it every day, so we were just falling down. Yeah, and I mean those bugs were reported to us; they weren't bugs that we'd found. I, yes, it was it was a Sisyphean task of uh, of doing the open the web stuff. And one thing I remember though did get better because at the beginning of my tenure, two thousand and eight, and we would write to people and say, "Hey, you know, do you know your website doesn't work in Opera Mini?" And they go, yeah, what ifs, if they ever got back to us at all. But by the, towards the end of my tenure at Opera, big companies would approach me at conferences and say, we really need to be on Opera Mini. How do we go about it? And I think that was a lot to do with the realization that um, uh, you know Silicon Valley companies were saturating their own market, uh, and the realization had had come to them that not only was 
they're a world outside Europe and America, but actually that world would be the the growth, the demographic growth for the next few decades. And if you ain't in there now, your competitors will be. Even as a consumer in America, I just lived in rural places with very, very terrible <laughs> internet. And as such, I chose to only invest in a low end device. <laughs> So I used as my primary device, like very cheap phones, and those things sell a lot. And if you recall, when we went from everybody had desktop browsers, and that, well, that was it, you know, like, and you imagine like, what is the total possible market of desktop browsers? Well, it is limited like this. And then suddenly, mobile phones came along. And suddenly, it's like, at least that times two. But it's even higher because like you can buy these cheap mobile devices that plenty of people have them that don't have a desktop computer even, right? Like that is their computer. And then tablets came along and it's like, oh, well, now there's a whole nother thing. Well, what's interesting here is that Egalia, we do a lot with embedded. Uh, that market is like that. Like it is, there are billions of new devices coming online all over the world and they actually share something because the embedded devices tend to be very underpowered. All browsers are not the default ones on the device have the problem with, well, the default one's good enough. Chrome on an Android phone is good enough. Safari on an iOS device is good enough. And even if it isn't, bad luck. Um, so a non-default device has to really, really, really work hard to be not only better, but demonstrably better and be demonstrably better to somebody who doesn't really understand what a browser is either. Yeah, this is this is actually a really tricky thing on the topic of ecosystem health that it's been uh, difficult to like find the right way to bring it up or, or, or the right context to bring it up in. I feel like there are several things that we've shown, if you look at the history, that play into this. So one is when IE began being pushed with the operating system that had a very clear effect because most people are learning about it for the first time. Their only experience with the web was Internet Explorer. And so it just had to be good enough, right? It just had to be good enough. And, and, it, and it kept getting better and it was able to maintain its market share and dominance. Now that's like pretty standard. Like there's no operating system that doesn't ship a browser with it. And they're generally they're pretty good. So this, this is a problem. But then there's a challenge to that, which is that so it's not uncommon to have like an iPhone, a Windows desktop, and some like Linux embedded system in your house. And the integrations then are more difficult unless you then also control a services tier. And when you get on those services tiers, you can also push your browser. <laughs> this is like, I feel like it's really difficult for browsers to compete on quality these days or or like what what do you think is a way that somebody like other than implosion uh, of the dominant player how do you how do you change things it's, it's very it's very hard to market a browser these days uh, uh when when people have to download their own browser then they you know they read articles and they listen to their friends and uh uh, they had to make a conscious decision, but like you say, now it, it's just there, and and you don't really care so much. People aren't that passionate about them anymore. So I, I don't know how to. I mean, I think Opera is still doing a pretty good job of this in the emerging markets. Uh, they have more users now than they had uh, when the Chinese bought the the browser, which happened a few years ago. So they're they're still doing growth uh, by being very you know, conscious of, of, of where they can, should use their energy. Um, in my days, it was, it was easier for me to convince 100 students in Indonesia to, to download and use Opera than to convince my neighbor in Oslo to do the same thing. So, you know, you had to, you had to focus. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting ecosystem that we've created, perhaps inadvertently. It seems like there's a lot of discussions, especially recently, uh, about existential threats to the web and people don't agree what the existential threats to the web even are i think that's part of why this is a really good thing to have a big large discussion about the broader health of the ecosystem and what what things matter and what things matter to us the company who believes in web it's not the biggest threat to it uh the companies who think uh, web is just one of many platforms i think 
probably is a threat or at least closer to it. I don't think there is a single threat to single biggest threat to, to, to the web as a platform. I think it's just way too important to us. So we could, we always see every, everything that happens here and there as a threat because yeah we know how fragile it is and uh, that, that that feeling that it does not belong to any company or, or it's it's basically self-sustained thing uh it it makes us fear for it for its future and that's that's why we always see that there's a there is a threat there is a there is a problem and i uh, if you if you live long enough you see that uh, threats and they come and go and uh, platform is still is still alive and i don't i don't i'm not pessimistic about it the thing that worries me here is that the the cost of maintaining an engine keeps going up and up and up and it is now complex enough that i believe that really only an economic powerhouse could even consider really making a modern web rendering engine currently chrome is uh, a little over 10 years old. It's, I think, 12 at this point. But it has something like 84,000 person years of development into the code. And like that's not even to mention standards work that went into it and testing work and all that stuff like that's just the, the code estimate like that's a lot of money yeah that, that, that's a lot of money but if i if you allow me to change the topic slightly here because there is a small company that i happen to be the chairman of the board of we have about uh, you know a handful of employees uh, most of them in melbourne in australia that have uh, made a, a rendering engine javascript engine everything you need to render web content. No, it doesn't go to a, a screen. It doesn't go to a browser. It's not a, you know, dynamic 50 frames per second. It's, it's PDF document. This is prints that converts HTML and CSS uh, to PDF. But it's still possible for a handful of people to write that code. Part of the secret ingredient here may be that the prints rendering engine is written in Mercury, which is a exotic programming language also invented in Melbourne, uh, in Australia. It's very well made, very efficient for implementing, for example, CSS. But, but still, uh, there is a core to the web that's fairly simple still. Uh, I know there's lots of parts on the side. So hopefully some of the parts that we don't use so much or don't work so well will die and that we will keep a core of, of, of web functionality. I hope that you know, the H1 element, the P element in HTML will, will live uh, uh, for a very long time. I think my hypothesis on this is that a computer 500 years from now, if you go into a computer store 500 years from now, you know, will there be computer stores 500 years from now? We don't know that. And, and the prediction is very far ahead so that nobody can tell me I'm wrong. But I think those computers will be able to read the H1 element and to use the font family CSS property. So in actually in my article, I, I did talk about this, that we say that there are three engines, but what we're talking about is modern browser engines that do everything that the web does. But really, like you say, I mentioned there are several. Uh, there's prints that you make. Uh, you have a competitor antenna house that also has a rendering engine, yep. I believe. And um, Amazon also Actually, Amazon has multiple rendering engines, but in, in terms of like a, a print related thing that's similar, there's also one of those. Those like they do something different and like they're a market that we don't talk about a lot. But I part of me thinks it is actually a really important market. <laughs> it's interesting that there's basically the same number, right? There, there's really three sort of big competitors there. Likewise, they have like different investment ideas and different priority ideas and stuff like that. Um, but I wonder, like, is it possible that we could get some other reader mode or EPUB reader or something like that where, uh, like, none of those are open source? Like, is do you think that there's maybe some opportunity there for, like, together? I certainly, I certainly think browsers should should be be better at doing reader mode and and to do EPUB. I think EPUB should be. I mean, EPUB is basically just HTML anyway, right? Uh, we we want there to be a a very simple core format for for books for magazines uh, that any browser can handle. Uh, it's it's really weird that those worlds have have been so separate uh, and and uh, i believe you know books too printed books too will be around we we don't want to print everything we read obviously we will see most things on our screens and most things 
that we read will be rendered uh, by a modern browser engine. But there are cases when you do really want to have a physical book in your hands and you want to give the gift or you want to, you know, put it on your your bookshelf, which is probably shrinking, but you're still going to, you're going to have them. And then for that moment, you want to be able to convert just about any web content into a PDF file, which you can, can print out uh, on your, you know, book producing printer. There is a sort of a five-year plan to implement the sorts of fundamental ideas that would be necessary to make that story a lot better in browsers. I'm wondering what does this look like for the princes and and stuff like that, like these other rendering engines, and what what does their future look like? I can see many possibilities, but one that I speculated about is like it must be difficult to make something really competitive with a small team, and are there opportunities for those companies to somehow work together to reduce that burden. I, I don't know. What do you what do you think about that? I can only speak on behalf of of Prince and and the Prince developers are quite quite happy. They feel a bit isolated at home these days, but that's because of you know uh, the pandemic, not because of the competition. Prince is a profitable company that has very you know a, a good number of customers who who use web standards to create uh, invoices, to create medical records to create uh, university textbooks, et cetera. And HTML is increasingly becoming the master format for all human knowledge, and, and therefore you need the tools to, to convert them. And when, when customers come to us and say, you know, can you turn my web page into, um, into a book? Then we say, we look at the code and say, hmm, well, uh, probably yes, but you will have to make some changes. We, we, we don't do, I mean, all the frameworks that often use very dynamic HTML features that use the DOM extensively, it, it's hard to render those into PDF. So you, we will have, we kind of have to tell people to get back to the basics, start out with HTML anew, and then add your CSS uh, style sheet for print, which isn't that different from the CSS, you know, but it, it, you know, you had to add things like footnotes and running headers and footers, page numbers and such, things that you want to appear in your printed publications that you haven't uh, thought about much in the on-screen use. So the tools are the same, but the style sheets will be different. But uh, you know, the, the, the very reason why a Prince XML exists because uh, other browser engines are not interested in printing. Yeah, I think that's a... That's a Good point. I tried to, you know, have Opera do printing really well. I thought that was an area where we could distinguish ourselves, but nobody really cared. None of our customers cared. And as the web moved to mobile phones, even fewer people cared about printing. So that was a a, a non-starter. It's it's true that the market has been a little left to to those who can provide solutions. The web has focused more on the fifty frames per per second market. Well, let me attest to that because I'm in the curious position where my degree is English English literature and drama, um, and I'm an old fella, so I'm a, a bibliophile. And it wasn't until I started doing some consultancy work for Halcom, uh, and yeah, disclosure, I do occasional consultancy for prints. It wasn't until I did that that I, I realized just how rudimentary the printing abilities of CSS as she is standardized actually are. You know, think things things that are on every book, footnotes, uh, you know, floats that protrude into columns of text, balancing things up so they're pleasing to the eye. All of these kind of things are absolutely central to every book you've ever read just impossible with the current standards. And I think that's what uh, Prince and Antenna House et al. have to do. I'm very happy to have Bruce Bruce and other bibliophiles along here because, you know, uh, printing books is, uh, you know, hundreds of years of tradition. Gutenberg is, you know, there were th- people before Gutenberg as well, but Gutenberg is, you know, 500 years back in time. And he established some of these aesthetical techniques uh, that that we are still using, you know, he laid things out. He 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 did the letting. He did the uh, hyphenation. He 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 invented fantastic oils for printing. Many of the things that we associate with books today uh, come from that that age. And 
I will work very hard to make sure we can replicate all of this in CSS. We're not, we're not quite there yet. For example, we can't do baseline alignments. If you have text in two columns, you can't enforce that all the baselines uh, of, of adjacent columns are the same. So there are things lacking in standards as well. So there is a lack of focus on printing, but I'm, I'm happy to hear Brian say that things will get better. I'm not sure about the five-year plan thing, so what I mean here is that web browsers were built like not for books, basically. They were a new medium and they had to work on like n different screens and they had to work with like ASCII text reading and like all, all different kinds of constraints. And as a result, we built what is effectively tech debt. And we, to some extent, painted ourselves in a corner with this focus on very particular kinds of things that made other kinds of things considerably harder and more expensive to balance at the same time. But there have been a lot of talks about this and other ideas that are also very, very difficult to consider with where we sort of painted ourselves into. And so all of the browser rendering engines have uh, determined like uh, how do we get there so that we can consider all of these other really interesting things that we have thus far been mostly unable to consider. Things like regions and exclusions and um, pagination and things like that. So they're all doing this multi-year, like basically five-ish year investment to rewrite their engines to support an architecture that allows them to do those kind of things. And one of the pressing reasons that is in here is that as the market has grown, as the web has expanded into all these things, like there's the web in your refrigerator, digital signage, um, the PlayStation, your TV, your cars, like everything, everything, everything is built with web technology now. People are imagining all different sorts of things and building all different sorts of things. And whereas yesterday, it might not have been super important for anybody to have print, it is actually getting increasingly more important because, for example, Microsoft Office 365, Google Docs are aimed at basically enterprises and uh, enterprises have products that do very good print. Uh, so they have like real needs and business drivers helping them forward on this. And I think that's really, really good. Maybe there is an opportunity to collaborate to make the actual web engines better. Mm. But I think another interesting possibility that I'm trying to ask about is like, maybe there's like a different kind of engine that is like the not the web engine that is, I, I don't know what its constraints are. Maybe it's like a reader mode kind of engine or just a print engine or a print and reader mode and EPUB kind of engine, something that would do less basically, but would still be a very good experience for a whole lot of really important things and would allow really good print. <laughs> I like I wonder is there a possibility for these engines to somehow help one of those two paths forward? Yeah, you know, I'm 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 a minimalist at heart, so everything you said there, you know, appeals to me. If we can kind of get get to the the the, the back to the basic reading experience. I'm not optimistic though, um, cuz I think like there will always be those asking for more. Like the the office uh, documents that example that you gave people will once they have a, a browser up they will want to do google docs editing and and there you want to have footnotes and edit those footnotes i think you gain something by cutting code but i'm not sure you gain enough to to compete i don't know i think reader mode is is a nice example of an innovation that i really appreciate but it's not standardized. It's not uh, described in, in any way. So every company that does it, uh, does it its own way by trying to detect all the possible class names, uh, uh, semantical tags and uh, microformats and things like that. And it's, it's a mess, to be honest, at the moment. It's a very interesting mess, though. I remember when we did uh, the small screen rendering mode in Opera that was basically Opera Mini where you basically wanted to take out everything that wasn't necessary. And you wanted to do that in the server because you didn't want to spend bandwidth uh, transferring those. So then you look for class names, right? You look for class equal add. Then you have a good guess that this is not something you want to spend uh, time and money transmitting. And then you can look at, 
you know, if, if a GIF image had a certain size, like 180 times 80 or some, some of these common banner sizes, then you also drop them. So you use a, a bunch of heuristics. Of course, once you set out using those rules, the advertisers will, 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 will see what you're doing. So they will change. Uh, so it's a, sort of a cat and mouse, uh, very messy. You're right, Vadim, but also very, very entertaining. Well, the problem with the, the, the reader mode it only exists because so much of the web is absolute crap. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. And the reason so much of the web is absolute crap is the business model of, of advertising. Well, it's not the only use case because um, people have different uh, preferences. I mean, uh, they, they some people prefer to read uh, text at certain size or at certain background or with certain font apply to it and uh, like uh, th this this famous example like daring fireball uh, website uh it's like it's dark gray on light gray it's impossible to read i i i would never read it myself so every time I, i'm there i'm enabling reader mode it's just a choice of a designer choice of a developer and um, we should be able to to handle it somehow, but we don't we we don't have a standard for that. We have just uh, I don't know. I think we should uh, developers and browsers should agree should should uh, all agree that we need some sort of um, standard for this. So um, so developers should I guess, maybe we already have it like semantic HTML like put everything uh, important on your page into a main tag and leave the rest uh, out of it so it will not interfere with the uh, reader mode maybe we already have we, we should just enforce it somehow I think I think we have we have some of the ingredients uh, and and also with regards to advertisement I don't think reader modes means no advertising at all I think one of the one of the joys actually of opening a paper magazine is seeing you know who's advertising here. I think the Chanel uh, Chanel advertising. Uh, I remember they put in, you know, real perfume once. I don't think you can do that on screens uh, <laughs> yet. Yet, but that smells so so good uh, yet. But but yeah, advertising can also be a feature if it's static. I don't, you know, you don't want the noisy, very dynamic ones uh, when you're in that reader mode yourself. I I tried to push for this. We tried to do this in Opera with the Opera Reader. Which was trying to in, in, introduce a, a page based a page based mode uh, on a dynamic screen. So you know you took a, a a tablet and and you went into the reader mode, and there you you went from one page to the other. So it was a pagination issue rather than a scroll bar issue. I'm not I'm not so fun, fond of of scroll bars, uh, but but we we. Couldn't really make make that work at the time. Uh, what do you think of uh, pages, uh, Brian? You like? I think pages? it is a really interesting thing that I was trying to get at, which is that the web has like so many uses that like it can wind up being not especially good at doing any of them because you think that they all should be the same. But we make so many choices with regard to design, thinking that it's your website that. I don't know. We I feel like we kind of get away from what makes it really pleasurable to read. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I, I have to have my my header menu always has to be at the top. Like it, it just has to, and like it needs to be, you know, make the logo bigger, right? <laughs> like, um, and you know, this should have a sidebar, and it needs to have this thing. And I I feel like very frequently I want to for many 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 reasons i want like i want to take that and say i just i wish i had a book of this basically right yeah. like something where i have that experience but not not a pdf pdf i think is actually terrible like it's great for print because it it describes exactly what you're going to print but the user experience of pdf is not great in my yeah. in my my opinion well it's funny you say that because uh you know as i said i'm a bibliophile uh, and I still buy physical books, but I also have a Kindle and I really enjoy reading on the Kindle. And I notice this is not you know, not groundbreaking, but it occurred to me that the Kindle is a page based mechanism. You know, I, I click something or I touch something on the, uh, the modern Kindle and it moves me a forward a page. It's not that infinite scroll that I, I somehow find terribly demoralizing. And, and, and I've been known to uh, print out websites using prints to PDF and then converting them and sending them to my Kindle so I can read them page by page in a, a nice-to-hold device. So there is, there is merit to page-based 
layout. Yeah, so. I think it would be fantastic, like for like even for my own blog, right? For me to be able to say, like, uh, you know, some of my blog posts are rather long. Um, <laughs> you might you might have noticed. Uh, yes, yes, but. Uh, but you know, like I, I don't want to overwhelm anybody. I like I would like to show somebody like nice content and determine where page breaks are, and like just give them the opportunity to say, you know, I'm looking at this in the web, and that's how I prefer to look at it. But I would like to make sure that they have a nice kind of reader mode experience that includes the ability to swipe pages. You know, like let me let me define page. Uh, you know, with, uh, I'm reading a lot of books in uh, EPUB format on my iPad, sometimes on my iPhone, and uh, I have um, I have a problem with EPUB or uh, auto-generated format. So, like PDF is fixed format, uh, EPUB is flexible. So it it, it rege regenerates its uh, the book uh, the medium uh, every time you rotate a screen. So it tries to fit your content. And every time I read a book with some pictures in it, I, it fails miserably. Like uh, I have half a page. Uh, on the left side, and then ha em half a page is empty, and then the next page is empty, and the picture goes on the third page, uh, which I need to to um, go through. And uh, it's it's really hard to understand if it's the end of a chapter or it's just a yeah something's go uh, some something's wrong with my book. So uh, I think web. Uh, where, where I'm going to, uh, I think web is not ready to to adapt to such format because when it's a book, it's it's laid out in a fixed medium or more or less. But when it when it needs to adapt to pages, we have a lot of problems there. Thing is, Vadim, in a few years' time, you'll be reading books without pictures, so it'll be it'll be <laughs> problem problem solved. <laughs> This is a really interesting topic is the stuff that is like currently on the fringe of the web and like what what does the future look yeah. like for that? Um, I, I think it is messy now and I think it's like partially OK that it's messy. I think I, I would rather have a, a, a place where there is like mess and experimentation before we go to try to write down the thing that we know is the right answer, because it's frequently judged by criteria that we don't even know exist. <laughs> like the technically best answers frequently don't win. Mm -hmm. And like I, there's no end to inventions that were created that wound up actually not winning at the thing that they were invented for, but being fantastically useful for something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I mean, m most of the web is like the history of post-it notes, which were invented accidentally and almost thrown away because they didn't actually stick properly until somebody at 3M thought, well, actually, this ability to stick something down and then take it off without leaving a residue might be a good idea. You know, that so much on the web is things not doing what they were originally supposed to do or the least good solution actually being the one that got adopted. And also including the, the web itself. Right? Including the web itself. Uh, and also, you know, it, it's great because every week, every week, somebody blows my mind with a blog post saying, you know, I did this and this in CSS and I made that. And I'm not talking about, you know, making picture perfect images of X or Y with only CSS. I'm talking about something I saw Adrian Rosselli do where he was making backgrounds on fit position sticky table headers using radial gradients and i just love the fact that people are experimenting all the time and inventing new stuff and some of it's a I, I certainly think the the CSS art sites are really, really great. Nobody planned for it, but it happened, and it's beautiful. Yeah, I bet you never thought that uh, people would be making the Mona Lisa out of CSS when you and Bert were um, wondering how to... That was not what we were aiming for, correct. It was not a considered use case. That's right, exactly. So can I ask, like, why did you create Prince exactly? Because, like, you were at Opera, Opera could have done. You said you, you you sort of were interested in that. Well, actually, I, I didn't create Prince. Prince was created by uh, Michael Day and uh, his wife. But uh, I joined, I saw the need for a print-based solution. And uh, it came uh, became very important when Bert Boss and myself, we wrote a book on CSS and we wanted to use 
CSS to format that book. We had used the FrameMaker for the first and second edition, but we thought for the third edition, you know, we should eat our own dog food. The question then it became, you know, how can we do so? Can we find a browser? Uh, Opera wasn't good enough and none of the other browsers were either. But then Prince came along and and they posted to the Vavava style mailing list that here's our new product, check it out. And, and I tried it and it did so many things right. It had the basic pagination was there. Uh, it, it couldn't do hyphenation at the time, but we solved that by running a Perl script over the text and adding soft hyphens uh, all over. So we were able to hyphenate the book as well. And, uh, and uh, we could do f- figures, we could do page numbers, we could do running headers and footers. So we were able to create a PDF that was uh, ready to be sent to the printer. This was in 2005, so it's 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 long time ago. But it, that was that was the start of why I got engaged in the Prints product. I found that by joining as um, chairman of the board, that's a, a a nice way to have some of your favorite bugs fixed. <laughs> I think that there's like a a similar history here with something like tech, right? Like um, with like Knuth. Oh, that's such an honor to be you know compared to uh, Donald Knuth himself. I'm I'm not in that league, but you're right. Uh, he he did. I think he paused his masterworks on programming uh, because he had to write the typesetting system to to make it uh, beautiful enough. Uh, that's true. Yeah, M- math is a is a interesting example. I, I don't know if you know that Galia is uh, sort of leading the charge to get uh, a final and actually interoperable MathML. We're closing in on that. Hopefully, by the end of the year, we'll finish MathML core and the web in all the browsers will have finally some pretty beautiful math rendering. Um, how, how's prints on MathML? It's pretty good, or pretty pretty good. Uh, I think we should align ourselves with your efforts there. We we have some deficiencies, and I know that some of our customers have resorted to a JavaScript library instead. But uh, I think having a core set of MathML features would be wonderful. So this actually leads me to a, a different question, which is uh, a thing that I found a little bit like frustrating, actually. So I don't know of a company. This this is why I think that browsers or a, another thing that isn't the browser like should come along where you could. I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing out wild ideas, but like we could create a print protocol and register a protocol handler where you could like you're in the browser, but you launch to you know, your view where you want to actually have good quality printing, <laughs> like, or pagination, that, that kind of thing, uh, like a different way to consume the, effectively the same content or something like that. Um, I don't know of a business that doesn't want to print something like you said, invoices, I worked for a college, and we had to print transcripts, you know, like, well, like actual print needs. And very frequently, you could see those things online, it, we had to build systems that would build and maintain views of those but then frequently it was difficult to you would want to take that content and send it to some system and if you recall back on the web i don't know 20 years ago it was just like you would have like uh ppk's compatibility tables or something like that like and you would have to find the intersection (laughs) but it's very very difficult to figure out like what can i use that is actually going to work everywhere And I had some kind of like similar problems with like print and PDF generation where like I couldn't figure out like there was no kind of can I use Mm. for them. And so I'm wondering like with the like, do you have some something like web platform tests or or can I use for printing? We tend to communicate with the potential users uh, through sample documents, uh, sort of, uh, you know, this is how you can do uh, this and this and this. just use the source code and modify it, which was, you know, how websites were set up in the early days. I, I'm not aware of anyone specializing in uh, the can I use thing, although there is a lot of, there's a fair uh, amount of testing going on, on in, in the print world as well. I approached uh, can I use to ask them if they wanted to include uh, the print engines, but Alex Deveria said, you know, quite legitimately, there's so many um, web rendering engines or variants thereof, because of course Chrome isn't Chromium. There are a variants of Chromium all over the place that it was just becoming unwieldy, which is fair enough because the majority of the people who go to Can I Use are interested in web web behind glass moving at 60 FPS. 
Yeah, but I, I wasn't really suggesting that it has to be cannot use. I, like, I, I think that there's a really positive thing about the web commons that we, we don't have to share everything. We don't have to have all the same goals and everything. But one of the things that drives that is this idea that you can use sort of the same technology everywhere. But it, it is actually like subsets of technology and that can get unwieldy to understand. So we have a lot of clients that ask us about you know, like what things can you have on here? You know, so that's a, that's a, like an interesting question. I was just wondering if like the print community has just like has an answer to that that I just was not able to find. Uh, I think it would be a really positive. Yeah, I, I don't think it exists uh, yet. Uh, I think uh, there's there's room for somebody to do some work there. I wonder if there is something disruptive here that I wrote a post on this, I don't know, two, two weeks ago. I had been writing it for a little while, but when Firefox announced they were laying off a quarter of their staff, I decided like it, I should post it even if it's not ready because there's pertinent thoughts in there. And basically what it says is that the model of a few really big companies funding and doing that basically through search is like not great. And what Egalia does is like sort of to help that problem. Um, we, instead of saying like, you, we have to go and ask the browser vendors to give us a slice of the pie that we're asking for, like we're, we, we would like these print features in the web, then they have to make some priority decisions about whether that's the right thing for them to spend their money on. Uh, with like with a galley, you just bring more pie, right? <laughs> like we can have more people bringing pie to the party instead of uh, having to share the pie with everybody. Um, do you think that there is a way for us to disrupt that? Like I think of TV and I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother, she thought that cable was just absolutely, why would somebody pay for television? It comes over the air for free. Um, oh. She just thought that was like completely unbelievable. But uh, like we have so many models for creating entertainment now, and I, I feel like there's something to that that makes it more robust and more avenues for different kinds of success. Do you think that the web could change like that in some way? Well, or? you know, we, when we uh, when Internet Explorer had ninety percent plus uh, of the users, we were pretty um, you know uh, negative in opera i i'd say we were depressed about that situation you know could this ever change uh there there sort of the the microsoft ice age was over us w w would it ever get better and it turns out things got better and and now we have different problems we don't have microsoft as a problem anymore uh we have other big companies that are problematic in some ways will things change again i think so Will it solve all our problems? I don't think so. But I don't think we're stuck in a Facebook or a Google Ice Age uh, anymore. I think, uh, I think there's room for development here. And I'm encouraged by... I, I, I'm not Captain Open Source per se. Um, people used to ask me in Opera, isn't Open Source important? And I said, yeah, it's, it's really important. But open standards is actually what makes the world go round. But I do think the advantage with the major rendering engines now being open source is nice people like yourselves, Brian, at Egalia can go in and and do work. You know, I, I know that um, Bloomberg funded, uh, funded Egalia to implement CSS Grid because they wanted it. And they wanted it now, so they hired you lot, and 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 you made it thus, and you have the trust of the people who are the gatekeepers in WebKit and Blink and Gecko enough that they would upstream your work. And I don't know, Brian, if I, I don't know how come if Brian's told you about the open prioritization project they're doing at Egalia. I know this is an Egalia podcast, but I'm not being sponsored to say this. I think that this can be a really interesting and encouraging experiment on a future potential other way of getting stuff into the standards. Do you want to give, how come the 45 second helicopter view, as we biz people say? Yeah, I mean having more ways to fund the commons is actually really, really healthy. And so one of the things that we're experimenting with is we partnered with Open Collective. Basically, we took six features 
that are uncontroversial. They're different sizes. They cover different areas of the platform. They're in different browsers, but they're things that we could, in theory, help move forward. We provided a fixed price estimate on them, and we said, go make it so. However, <laughs> however you make it so, and we'll do it. So it could be, you know, 10,000 developers who each give a dollar or two, yeah. you know? Or it could be a combination of like companies that think that this is important and they each give a couple of thousand dollars. So that so that's what open prioritization is an experiment around that. And we would like to expand that a lot actually and like get more kinds of investment and more voices into the prioritization because they don't like they don't always align, right? Google has not really had core philosophical problems with MathML itself, but they have thought like it, it's just not a priority for us. So is that how you fund the work on MathML? Like people are crowd of funding, they pay per uh, formula or something? We did it through a sponsorship model. So we got an initial grant from the Sloan Foundation oh, yeah? through the Institute for Standards Organization. And uh, we got some from APS Physics. And Pearson publishers pledge some money. We really believe that it's important, like societally important. If you want to be able to have the web reach its potential to do the things that it was intended to do, to be able to share research and all that kind of stuff, like you, you can't do that without being able to render math. Absolutely, it, it, it's very worthwhile. It's it it improves the uh, semantic semantics of HTML by being able to mix in uh, formulas. All right, so I think that's all the time that we have. I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for coming on. This was fun. I hope that some of the conversation was interesting to people. Well, thanks for inviting us and thanks for putting it on. I think it's so great that somebody's actually interested in both the history of a rendering engine because they do, you know, these engines display most of the content that we're reading on screens, most of the content that humanity is reading on screens. So we should be interested in how, where they come from and where they're going. So thank you to, to you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Haukum and Vadim. And yeah, um, such discussions makes me make me optimistic about the future of the web. So I think it's it's good to know that there are people who care. So web is not doomed as other people that's, might, that's at least four of us <laughs> don't worry we'll keep it going <laughs> perfect thank you so much thank you dear listeners thank you dear listeners for listening to our support group bye